welcome back for another little browse through uh, my Star Wars book, The Making of Star Wars, by J. W. Rinsler. Plenty of pages to um, flick through here, as you might have seen <clears throat> in my last in my episode last week. I'd like to open up on an <clears throat> interesting page as ever. Anything that's got a lot of colour in it is an interesting page, I always think. Of course, the, the original duel between um, Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi was a bit flat compared to what we had in the uh, prequels. So that was quite, um, quite special, the lightsaber duels in the prequels. But, uh, you know, they were what they were for the time. It was incredible how they managed to do the special effects on the lightsaber. I forget the details of that now, um, having read it in this book, but um, I've forgotten it now, unfortunately. <laughs> I don't really want to um, come out with any facts that are inaccurate. And um, I did actually give a slightly inaccurate fact uh, in my last video, and that was um, R2-D2's, the origin of his name. Uh, it wasn't real to disc two. It was, of course, real to dialogue two. Uh, the basic story is still the same and amazing. Um, just a slight little change there. Look at this. I absolutely love any picture that's got stormtroopers in it. If, any, if ever anybody asks me what my favourite Star Wars character is, I always say. Uh, Stormtroopers. Not really a character as such, but uh, I won't say anything else because I just think they're, they're great. They might be inept uh, in what they do, but um, especially shooting, but uh, I just, they just look fantastic when they're all lined up. I think it's a bit odd that George Lucas decided to call them Stormtroopers when only... 30 years beforehand, there had been you know, Nazi stormtroopers. So it was a bit odd that he chose that word, but he went with it and it's, it's worked. Anthony Daniels. Um, the only um, actor that's been in all nine episodic Star Wars films. Um, in the prequels, just doing the voice. But uh, yeah, he's an amazing. I just recently listened to an interview uh, with him, actually. Uh, stories he has are amazing. I've recent, recently read his book as well. He's a great guy. Trash compactor. Ah, uh, Peter Mayhew. Recent, relatively recently passed. Actually, about two years ago, I think. Peter May, he was Chewbacca. He was a, I think he was a hospital porter before he was in Star Wars. It's amazing now, we think, George Lucas. George Lucas, what an amazing guy, just to be in his presence. At the time, yes, he had made a couple of movies. American Graffiti and THX 1138. But um, he was basically an unknown. So at the time, people wouldn't have been awed by being in his presence. They certainly are now. Didn't notice this picture before, but I guess these are the actual performers that were in the Stormtrooper costumes in that particular scene. 
we tend to think, don't we, that, you know, if you get, a, if you were to buy a Stormtrooper outfit that might cost like $5,000 or something now, if you were to buy one nowadays, there's no way they would be anywhere near as good quality as the originals, props, prop costumes, you know, from the film. But in actual fact, they're probably a lot better because as you can see, these are all a little bit skew with a little bit patchy, not tremendously great. Bits would fall off costumes and they would have, as the filming went on, they would have less and less costumes to, um, to use. Great picture. It's an iconic image. By the way, the reason why Darth Vader and the Stormtroopers, the reason why it was originally uh, decided for them to have helmets was because they were not supposed to come through an airlock. They were, in fact, supposed to sort of drift through space or, or fire jetpacks or something like that to go from the Star Destroyer to the blockade runner at the beginning of Star Wars. And so therefore they needed helmets to protect themselves from space. That's the only reason why they were designed with helmets. But then they decided to have them enter through an airlock. It was, you know, more sensible, less ridiculous. Uh, but they kept the helmets. Which looks really good, of course. Early concept design by Ralph Macquarie. Beautiful sets here. It's beautiful. Explosions in space, yeah. Uh, of course, you can't have fire in space, um, but you know you have to take liberties with that sort of thing. Poetic license. Otherwise, you get bogged down in, in the reality of what you're doing when what you're trying to do is not reality. Early TIE Fighter concept design there as well. All this complicated gear. All sort of designed most of it from scratch for Star Wars. They kept designing and building and inventing things as they went along because the equipment didn't exist to do what they wanted. Ah, oh, now I see. See, that here's an example of what I meant earlier. All just sitting around. There's George Lucas. Nowadays, if you were in a room with George Lucas like that, you'd be, be taking photos of him, trying to get selfies with him. Back then, in a way, he was just one of the guys. Although, the most important one. And here is the blockade runner. It's a very interesting story with um, how the blockade runner got its cockpit and how the Millennium Falcon ended up the shape it was. Um, originally, the Millennium Falcon was going to be a long, I don't know, tube-like, rectangular uh, shape. Um, but Space 1999 was being created, the TV series, at the same time. And their main ships the eagles were the same shape. So, and Space 1999, Space 1999 was going to get released first. So George Lucas said, just make the Millennium Falcon any other shape other than, other than that. Just 
go completely the other way, like a big circle or something. So that's exactly what they did. They designed, they redesigned the Millennium Falcon and made it a big disc. Problem is, um, they uh, didn't have a cockpit. So they thought, well, you know, they didn't have time to build a cockpit. This was late in production, just before filming scenes. Uh, and so they just nicked the cockpit off the Tantive 4, off the blockade runner that they had already built, and stuck it on the side of the Millennium Falcon. And that's why the Millennium Falcon has a, a somewhat oversized cockpit stuck on the side of it. Of course, then they didn't have a cockpit for the blockade runner, Tantive 4. So what they did, because they were in a rush, and this is amazing, <laughs> and you can see pictures of it here, the blockade runner, they just looked around them on the desks and they saw two coffee cups. So they picked up two coffee cups and they stuck them together like that. And then um, stuck them on the end of the Tantive 4 blockade runner. And that became, um, I guess that's a cockpit as well. Um, but the, the, the stubby bit at the end, basically, that's also the cockpit. And it became two coffee cups stuck together. It's just amazing, isn't it? <laughs> um, anyway, it's an incredible story. Coming to your galaxy this summer, or the following winter, in, in our case, in the UK. Right, I think I might end uh, this video at this point. Thank you very much.